Jesus gave his life so man could truly be made free by the spirit that his father gave to you and me. It is like no other gift that you could ever get. And I pray that we will not forget to honor the gift of God. Honor the gift of God. Matthew 12, verse 14. But the Pharisees went out and took counsel against him, that's Jesus, how they might destroy him. They were provoked by Jesus healing on the Sabbath day, among other things. And Jesus wasn't trying to provoke anybody by healing on the Sabbath day. He was just being led by his father in what to do and what to say. <clears throat> it can be a real test sometime to keep your eyes focused on the father and what he wants when the people around you are telling you you're looking at the wrong thing. But Jesus never was moved from following the spirit. He was never moved from doing, following the lead of the father. Now when Jesus heard of this, that is they wanted to kill him, he withdrew from there, and large crowds followed him, and he healed them all. <clears throat> and he sternly charged them that they not make him known, so that what was spoken through Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled. Behold, my servant whom I have chosen. This is the father talking about the son. My servant whom I have chosen, my beloved, in whom my soul is well pleased, I will put my spirit upon him, and he will decree judgment for the Gentiles. He will not quarrel, nor will he cry aloud, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets, that is, to try to work a crowd, get, get well known, get attention, Increased numbers, that's not what he was about. Now, a bruised reed he will not break. And your, your version of uh, Matthew probably says something like a smoking wick or something like that. Smoking wick. So, yeah, wick is what we originally translated that word from. But in, in Isaiah, it's flax. And in the, in the uh, Greek, in the New Testament... It's, it's a material that a wick could be made out of, and a lot of translations have wick, but I don't think that's it. Because you can rekindle a, sm a smoldering wick. You can get it going again with a, something, a match or something. I think what uh, Isaiah said was, was correct. Like smoke, smoking or smoldering flax, he will not quench until he bring justice forth to victory. And in his name will the Gentiles hope. What is a bruised reed? Uh, most of you here have been through fields where there are straws standing up and you've stepped on some or bumped some or an animal's been before you, a dog or a deer, and they have hit some and not broken them in half it's where they're just hanging straight down, but they bent them over. There's no way you can make them stand up straight again. No way. If you even touch them to try to make them, it'll be too much for them. They'll flop over the other way. I've done it as a kid. That's a bruised reed. It's not broken in half. But it almost, if, even if a breeze, good breeze comes through, they might blow them all the rest of the way over. Same thing with smoldering flax. You take some of that straw in a field. Flax is kind of a strawy, has a strawy stuff with it. Um, very small, thin, lightweight. I've done this as a kid, got some of that straw and lit it and watched it. And as it was going out, I tried to blow it to see if it wouldn't come back and it just blew all to pieces, blew them everywhere. You cannot bring to life back flax or straw when it's burned down to nothing. You can't do it. But, that, but it's not so much what is smoldering flax or what is a bruised reed, it's who is a bruised reed. Amen. And who is that smoldering 
flax there. Let me tell you some people I've thought about. The woman caught in adultery was a bruised reed. She was hopeless. Nobody could fix her. The law itself condemned her. Everything on the planet condemned her. That was in Israel. But Jesus told her, go and sin no more. Adam, I'm not going to condemn you. Praise God. Praise. King David, caught in adultery and murder. He was a bruised reed. He said, I've got to die. My. We got 150 psalms from that man after the Spirit of God washed him and cleansed him and raised him back up. Mary Magdalene. She was a demon-possessed woman. Seven demons possessed her. And then she met Jesus. A demon-possessed woman. Nobody wanted her. Can you imagine what kind of life she must have lived as a young person to be possessed by seven demons? If she'd have been in our time, she'd have been covered in tattoos, ear piercings, and nose piercings. She would have been full of it. And Jesus delivered her, and God chose her to be the first person to see his son when he rose from the dead. Mm. The thief hanging on the cross was dying with Jesus. He was moments away from hell. No, no hope. Impossible to help him. Impossible to do anything. No sacrifices. He couldn't make a sacrifice. He was nailed to a tree. He couldn't go down and beg for forgiveness. And Jesus told him, Today you'll be with me in paradise. Now that's a bruised reed. Mm. How about young Saul of Tarsus? Blasphemed the name of Jesus. Hated it. Hated anybody associated with him. Partook of killing them. Impossible to fix <laughs> full of pride and sin and Jesus said to, to Ananias when he was praying said Lord are you sure you want me to go talk to this man he said go your way Ananias this man is a chosen vessel to me he's going to carry my word to the Gentiles mm. Mm. He's going to bear my name before kings and princes. And prin mm. God. Who's a bruised reed? We all have yeah, been. We all, we all have been helpless, yeah. Yeah. hopelessly lost in yeah. sin, yeah. come short of the glory of God, yeah. and, the, and the wages of sin is death. Yeah. Uncle Joe was a bruised reed. He found it out when he was in the army reading his Bible on his cot uh, on, there in the, in the barracks. And he was reading in the Old Testament. He found out he'd done things in his life that were worthy of death. Impossible to escape. Yeah. I love what Paul preached in Acts 13, I think it is. He said to the Jews, went to the synagogue first and said, We can be forgiven for things that the law cannot forgive us for. Yeah. The law that you're holding on to, I got something better. Yeah. Yes. Praise Ooh. God. Yes. I've received it. Jesus' disciples found out they were they were bruised reeds. Yes. When they asked Jesus, he got preaching one time. They said, "Woo, well, who then can be saved? Yeah. He said, well, with you guys, it's impossible. Oh, yeah, right. My, Woo, woo. but woo. not with God. Because God, all things are possible. Amen. Praise Amen. God. Amen. 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 Jesus didn't break us. He didn't blow us out. He gave us hope and a promise. Praise God. And his love for us is what drove him on. I love that song that said it wasn't nails that held him to the tree. It was love that held him there. His love for us was so great, he was determined to accomplish his mission and save us. No matter what the opposition. In verse, uh, and I look at Isaiah 50 here. Isaiah 50, verse 6, this is the Son of God talking about what he was going to go through, part of what he was going to go through. I just took a little section out. I gave my back to the strikers. That's when they whipped him. I gave my back. 
<laughs> they didn't take it. Right. I gave my back. Yeah. And I gave my cheeks to those who pulled out my beard. Wow. Yeah. They, didn't, they didn't force me to. I gave it. I did not hide my face from shame or spit. Wow. But the Lord God was my help. Amen. Therefore, I was not confounded, discouraged. God said in Isaiah in another place, he shall not be discouraged. God held him up. Therefore, I set my face like a flint. I am going to do, I'm going to follow my father. And I know that I shall not be put to shame. Wow. Jesus knew that powerful men were out to get him, to destroy him, to yeah. kill him. Right. But he kept right on teaching and healing. Verse 22 in Matthew 12. At that time a demon-possessed man was brought to him, blind and dumb. And he healed him so that the blind and dumb man both spoke and saw. And all the people were amazed and said, Isn't this the son of David? Son of David is another title for the Messiah. So they were feeling the right things. Yeah. And they were feeling them so strong, they were saying, This has got to be the one. This has got to be the one. But the, but the Pharisees, when they heard that, when they heard the people glorifying Jesus, they envied him, according to what we read later in the in the Gospels, in Mark 15. And they said, this man, and this is going to be different from some of your translation. I changed it to make it more like in, in harmony with the Greek. This man does not cast out demons except by Be Beelzebul, the ruler of demons. Now, that was pretty bad. But these Pharisees were bruised reeds too. They didn't have any hope. And so Jesus tried to reason with them. May, like Paul said, that I might gain some. Maybe. They just didn't realize how hopeless they were. So Jesus said, knowing their thoughts, he said to them, every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and every city or house divided against itself will not stand. And if Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? Now, some of the people listening, I'm sure, looked at each other and said, what's he changing the subject to start talking about Satan for? Because nobody knew Satan was bad. Nobody knew he was evil. That's just like Jesus trying to change the subject, get off the hook. <laughs> Jesus was the first human being ever to walk on earth that say anything bad about Satan. Nobody knew he was evil. Nobody knew that he was the ruler of demons, wicked spirits. The Jews thought the Philistine god Beelzebul was. So they just called him that. If they'd, if, if they'd uh, known that Satan was the chief of demons, they'd have called Jesus Satan. So here's Jesus saying, now if Satan cast out Satan, and then to make sure that the Jews didn't misunderstand him, he used the na name for Satan that, that they were familiar with. He said in verse 27, If I cast out demons by Beelzebul, because that's what they thought the chief of demons was, by whom do your sons, that's his disciples that he had sent out with power, by whom do your sons cast them out, therefore they will be your judges. Now why did he say that? It's because... Jesus had given his disciples power to cast out demons. But Jesus also knew that demons were over these Pharisees. He called them sons of Satan, sons of the devil. Now, if, if Satan is over the Pharisees, the demons are over the Pharisees, inspiring them, and the disciples are over the demons, then the disciples are in a position to be their judges. When God sets all things right. Mm. Glory to God. Jesus told him, he said, you're going to sit in my kingdom and sit on the 12 thrones of Israel and reign over the whole nation. That's what he's talking about. But 
if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, not Beelzebub, if this is by the Spirit of God, then God's kingdom is here. My, that's what the common people felt. This is the Messiah. He's going. He's bringing about the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God had come to them because the Holy Ghost was in Jesus. And the kingdom of God is righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Well, these men were looking for an earthly kingdom and high positions in it. And then Jesus said, But if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come to you. How can... This is another question. He, cha- he switches... Another, he's trying to get across to these people. Because he knows that he knows what they don't know that they're hopeless without him. How can anyone enter into the house of the strong man and plunder his goods except he first bind the strong man? Then he will enter his house. Well, who's the strong man? The Pharisees didn't know. Whose house was being plundered? The Pharisees didn't know. But the answer is Satan was the strong man because Israel had become his house. There are untold thousands of demons possessing people and controlling people among God's people. Mary Magdalene was a Jew. Demon possessed. The demons Jesus cast out earlier were Israelites. God's people possessed by demons all over the whole country. The ministers, the leaders, Jesus called them sons of the devil. Ministers of Satan. Israel had become Satan's house. And the Pharisees didn't know. But Jesus had bound Satan with a power Satan couldn't control. He had no part of, couldn't resist. And his house was being plundered every time somebody believed in Jesus because the truth sets people free. But it took the power to make it go. Had to bind him up. Mm. He, He who is not with me is against me. And he who does not gather with me scatters. There is no middle ground in spiritual warfare. In in, uh, earthly warfare, there's space between armies. It's called no man's land. There's no such thing in the kingdom of God. You're either on one side or the other and there's nothing in between. Nothing. Whoever is not walking in the light of God, listen to this, if you're not walking in the light of God, you're working against Jesus whether you think so or not. You're adding pressure to God's people. You're something else. You've become something else that those who love God have got to get over. You're adding pressure with the world on God's people to think of themselves as not all that's good. As small, unimportant. That's what the whole world's trying to get God's people to think. And when one of us gets off the track and starts living like the world, we agree with the world that that's what we are. And there's something else for the righteous to get over. You're against Jesus if you're not with Him. If you're not walking with Him, you're against Him. No matter what you want, what you think, or what you say. Then because the Pharisees had said that it was Beelzebub's power, not God's, working miracles through Jesus, Jesus gave them this warning. So then I tell you, Every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven men, but blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. Whoever speaks a word against me, the Son of Man, it will be forgiven him. 
But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven him, either in this present world or in the one to come. You may need to know this somewhere down the line. People worry, I've, I've talked to a number of them over my lifetime, worry that they have committed the unpardonable sin. I've had to help people get past that. But first of all, you should know that nobody can commit the unpardonable sin of blasphemy against the Holy Ghost except people who have it. Only God's people can do that, and in this covenant, that means somebody with the Spirit. It's only people who can do it. You'll see why. Sinners can blaspheme, that is, speak evil of God and of Jesus and of God, the body of Christ, and uh, they, can be, they can be forgiven. They can be forgiven because sinners don't have the power to commit the unpardonable sin of right. blaspheming right. the Holy Ghost. Right. It takes some power from God to do that. Yes, it does. Paul was a blasphemer before he was born again, but he was forgiven. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, he wrote this, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord that he put me into his service who once was a blasphemer. That's an unbeliever, unbelieving blasphemer. Yeah. And a persecutor and a violent man, but I have received mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. So Paul was once a bruised reed, hopeless, blasphemed the name of Jesus, had no, like Paul told the Gentiles in one point, you were once without God and without hope in the world. Well, he was a Jew, but he was still without hope because he hated Jesus. But Jesus took him in and made his heart pure, made him an apostle. Now, the only description that I know of in, in all the Bible that gives any details about blaspheming the Holy Ghost is in Hebrews. Here in Hebrews 6, we have a description of it. It is impossible for those who have once been enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and made partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted of both the good word of God and the powers of the age to come and then have fallen away to renew them again to repentance, seeing they are re-crucifying the Son of God in themselves and exposing him to public shame. So those who, those who commit the unforgivable sin are those who blaspheme the Holy Ghost after, after having been enlightened. You see them there underlined, I think having tasted of the heavenly gift and made partakers of the Holy Ghost and eaten of the Word of God. That's the true Word of God. He's not talking about Christian doctrine. The Word of God and tasted of the powers of the Word to come. There are not many of God's children anywhere on the planet that that describes. In other words, there's... Not many of God's people anywhere on earth that can blaspheme the Holy Ghost and have no hope of forgiveness. They don't know God. They haven't eaten His Word. They don't have the powers of the world to come. And it's not that close to Jesus. I say it this way. Very few people that belong to God are close enough to betray the Lord. Judas was close enough to betray Him. Very few people on this planet that belong to Jesus qualify to be a Judas. Judas raised the dead through the power of God. He cleansed lepers. He put broken bodies together. He healed the sick. He preached the gospel. He was with Jesus in miraculous times. He saw things. He felt things. He had something from God. And then he betrayed the Lord. Not many of God's people... Not many of God's people know where Jesus' secret place is where he goes to pray. It took somebody really close to him to lead the mob there to arrest him. Blasphemy is despising and speaking evil of the Holy Ghost after it washes us from sin and we've grown some in Christ. 
And Hebrews in chapter 10 warns us not to despise the Holy Ghost after it washes us from sin. He's talking to all of us now. Anyone that is in Israel who rejected the law of Moses, the Egyptians could reject it, and this doesn't apply to them. This is only for those in Israel. Anyone in Israel who rejected the law of Moses died without mercy by two or three witnesses. You know how they rejected the law of Moses? By disobeying it. Anyone under the law who disobeyed the law died without mercy if there were two or three witnesses there. Okay, now let's take this into the New Testament. Of how much worse punishment do you... Now, how much? what is worse punishment than dying without mercy, than being put to death mercilessly. God said in one case, I don't care if he runs and grabs hold of my altar, you drag him away and kill him. Oh, well, how much worse punishment do you think he's worthy of? Will he who is born again, talking about New Testament now, will he be worthy who has trampled underfoot the Son of God has regarded as, as if it's a common thing the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has done outrage to the spirit of grace. I've had people I've been in these meetings write me blasphemous letters about the spirit after they backslid and they got the Holy Ghost in our meetings. That's dangerous. That's dangerous. Don't do that. Judas, Jude called uh, those people twice dead. Jude chapter 1. These are clouds without water, carried along by winds, trees without fruit in harvest, twice dead and uprooted. My father once wandered so far from God Got off track with God. He said he missed God a thousand miles in his life. Must have been during those times. He wondered if he'd ever be forgiven. Wondered if he'd blasphemed the Holy Ghost. He didn't understand Hebrews yet. He didn't know. He was worried. He was one of those people that worried about it. And this was after he had been anointed. He had been enlightened. He had tasted of the heavenly gift. He'd been marked made a partaker of the Holy Ghost. He'd eaten of the good word of God and tasted of the powers of the world, of the world to come. And he, he was at Louisville at that time, really down in the dumps, feeling bad about himself. And he decided to cross the river and go into Indiana and be in a meeting with a great man of God named William Branham. So he did. He crossed the bridge and went over there, wherever the meeting was, when he went in, Brother Branham apparently had been told who he was or was introduced to him, and he asked my father to preach. Well, he was in no condition to preach. But he, he said, no, I, I came over here to hear you preach. And so William Branham preached that night. And if I remember my father's testimony, I'm sure I do, he said William Branham preached on blaspheming the Holy Ghost. And it William Branham fed him the knowledge of God, of what it meant, and let him know he could be forgiven. And he repented. And God, God did forgive him. Praise God. Hebrews also says, Hebrews also says this in Hebrews 10, 26. If after receiving the knowledge of the truth, we willfully go on sinning. There is no longer, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sin. Even in the Old Testament, if someone just decided, I'm going to sin, I don't care, and they just willfully sin, God provided no sacrifice for that. None. There is none. He said so. Well, if after William Branham had explained what blaspheming the Holy Ghost was and my father had that knowledge come into him, if he'd have continued in his darkness, he may never have been forgiven. If we go on sinning, 
after we've received knowledge of the truth and God had him there that night to get some knowledge of the truth so he could repent and have enough faith to repent and think that God was that big and that God loved him that much and that God's mercy was that great. That's what William Branham did for him. Praise God. Mm. My father didn't despise that truth and go on sinning the way Hebrews says and he wrote out his testimony in a song and i'm gonna sing i've been holding off my song until now <laughs> this is what i this is his testimony that i just told you about praise god god's mercy reaches to the clouds uh Anybody wants to join me, please do. You might cover up a bunch of my mistakes. Praise God. I love this song because it's so simple and so real. I remember years ago When the Lord I did not know How He sent conviction down upon my soul Oh, my sins were washed away, for I prayed both night and day, till Jesus saved me to be in his fold. Till Jesus took me, till Jesus saved me to be in his fold. I traveled.
Praise God. <laughs> Woo mm. One of the things my father emphasized, having gone through all that in his life, was that someone who knows the truth and has tasted the powers that come can be fooled and overcome by a weakness if they don't stay steady in the Lord. But he went on to teach us this. This is a very important thing. To be fooled and overcome is not to sin willfully. He said this a lot. He said, it's a good thing we can justify ourselves. Because if you can't come up with a justification for yourself doing wrong, you'll be sinning willfully. To be fooled and overcome is not to go on willfully sinning. Nobody who's unwillfully sinning, nobody who's fallen by being overcome by a fault is going to turn God down when he offers him a chance. He's going to be relieved at the opportunity. Oh, my, my, my. Praise God. If God comes to him and says, mercy's available, you want it? Yes, that's yeah. what I want. Yes, that's what I want. Yeah. Praise yeah. God. 
Amen. And Galatians, Paul said, if any of you overcome a fault, you who are spiritual, pray, bring him back. Go tell him there's mercy available. Hallelujah. But for the backslider to go on sinning after he's been offered mercy and told it's available to keep on down that road is to go on sinning willfully. What sacrifices is available? Scriptures say none. Mm. A righteous man can fall seven times, but he's tri he could be tripped up, fooled, and come up short of... But, but that is not willfully sinning. And when God lets him know mercy is available, he gets up. He gets up. And God lets him know 70 times, 7 times, yes. it is in his heart to go all the way with Jesus. As my father said in one of his tracks, I think it's the besetting sin, he said, no failure need be final but the failure to repent. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Then Jesus continues talking to these hard-hearted men who accused him of operating under Beelzebul's power. But he's getting harder, he's getting tougher on them as we go through this chapter. He really gets kind of stiff in a little bit. Either make the tree good, he's talking to them, either make the tree good or make the tree bad and its fruit bad, make the tree and its fruit good or the tree and its fruit bad, for the tree is known by its fruit. These men were in the worst possible spiritual condition which was partly good since jesus said they sat in moses seat so do whatever they tell you they know the scriptures that's good they know israel's history that's good they pray that's good but their heart is rotten that's bad god hates a mixture more than anything else he'd rather you be purely evil than to be half good Jesus told one of his pastors this in Revelation 3. 3 verse 15. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. This was, a, this was a man full of the Holy Ghost. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I would that you were either cold or hot. So, because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I'm about to vomit you out of my mouth. Kick you out of my body. He hates a mixture. Make up your minds. Like Elijah told Israel, how long are you going to go around limping up between two opinions? Maybe this leg. No, maybe that one. Maybe, maybe Baal. No, maybe Jehovah. How long? You're going to be in that, in that worst spiritual condition of all. Worshiping both. Worshiping many in addition to Jehovah. And by this time, Jesus was worked up. He was hot. You offspring of vipers. How can you, being evil, say good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. When Satan quotes the Bible, he's lying. I've seen men like that, known men like that, so far off track with God, they are a lie. Whatever they do is a lie. Whatever they say is a lie. If they read the Bible out loud, it's a lie. Because out of the heart, the mouth speaks. What's in your heart is what you say. And if God gives you ear to, ears to hear, and a heart to understand, you'll catch the lie even if a man's quoting the scripture. You'll know the spirits involved. The good man takes out good things from the good treasure. That's in your heart. And the evil man takes out evil things from the evil treasure. I tell you, every worthless thing that men may say, they will give account for it in the day of judgment. By your words will you be justified, and by your words will you be condemned. They pretty much shut their mouths, but then some others had, a, had some, a request to make. 
Then certain of the scribes and Pharisees answered, saying, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. Now, no doubt they wanted to see one of the signs that the prophet said the Messiah would do. It wasn't enough for them for Jesus to heal the sick, cast out devils, clean the devils, clean, clear, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, put missing body parts back on people, walk on water, feed thousands of people with a few loaves of bread and a couple of fishes. That wasn't enough. They wanted to see something. They wanted him to kill some Romans, raise an army, take over the world and make Israel great again and let them be officers in his government. But he answered and said to them, an evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, but no sign will be given to it other than the sign of Jonah the prophet. For as Jonah was in the belly of the whale three days and three nights, so will the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth three days and three nights. Now, of course, nobody understood what he was talking about. Nobody knew. Well, I don't even know if they were too sure who, who the Son of Man was. Jesus was a mystery to everybody. And I, I would point out again, even though he said that, the disciples were not there on the third day after he was crucified, sitting outside the, the tomb waiting for him to come up. Jesus used Jonas as a parable here, but look at how plainly he spoke to his disciples about rising from the dead at other times. And this is just a couple of samples. Matthew 26, you know that after two days is the Passover, and then the Son of Man will be handed over to be crucified. And Luke 9, let these words sink down into your ears. He was kind of frustrated that day. The Son of Man is going to be betrayed into the hands of men. But they did not understand this saying, and it was hidden from them so that they should not comprehend it, and they were afraid to ask him about it. Isn't that something? But as I told you before, God wasn't going to judge them on whether they understood Jesus or not. The disciples who had a pure heart stuck with him, and those that didn't drifted away at one point or another. Keep in mind that as we read this next, what Jesus says, 41. The men of Nineveh will stand up in the judgment against and testify against this generation and condemn it for they repented at the preaching of Jonah and behold something greater than Jonah is here and you're not <laughs> repenting the queen of the south queen of Sheba will rise up in the judgment and testify against this generation and condemn it for she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon behold something greater than Solomon is here so those who rejected Jesus and the men he sent out were, were facing an awful judgment. To whom much is given, much shall be required. He's given much, will suffer much if he doesn't live up to it. But that judgment, with that awful judgment won't come on Sodom and Gomorrah or this generation because they didn't understand Jesus. It'll come on them because they love darkness rather than light. Their heart was inclined to sin instead of to God. That's why the judgment was there. Jesus just brought it out. And what Jesus said next is as real as it is frightening. He said, when the unclean spirit comes out of a man. Now, Jesus knew whether or not an unclean spirit had really come out of a man or not. And he knew that demons do not voluntarily leave a house once it's moved in. Only the power of God makes it go. So when it comes out, when Jesus is saying it comes out, it's gone. It's cast out. So when he's cast out by the power of God, it travels through waterless places seeking rest, but God won't let him have it. God won't give demons a body. They forsook their bodies long ago and they don't get it back unless they find somebody willing to let them possess them. Jesus said then, because God won't give it a body, 
give its body back, I'll go back to my house that I came out of. Did you know that whenever a demon gets close enough to you, to where he gets you to move when he wants to move and feel what he wants you to feel and think, he considers your body his house? And he will always think that. Unless when he comes back, he doesn't find a place. And that's what Jesus describes next. When it comes, when it comes back to move back into his house, it finds the house unoccupied, swept clean, put in order. A, a house swept clean and put in order is someone who has cleaned up his own life according to the commandments and doctrines of men. He's orderly. He's clean. You know, Satan is a clean cut guy. He's a law and order guy. He loved the order and the discipline and the structure of heaven. He wanted to be second in command. He didn't hate it. He didn't want to destroy it. That's what he wants. And Jesus said Satan's not divided. His, his kingdom is orderly. So is the person who orders his life, makes it clean, becomes respected and welcome in society, is spoken well of by all men, he does what people think is the right thing to do, but his house is unoccupied. The demon hasn't been replaced with another occupant with power to keep it out. Unoccupied, but clean, neat, always doing the right thing. Who could reproach that? But all that man has done is provide that demon that left him a nice, clean home to come back to. And when he comes back, he doesn't come alone. The next verse. Then it goes, after it's moved in, it goes to visit relatives. It goes and brings with it seven other spirits, more evil than itself. And they come in and dwell there, and so the last state of that man is worse than the first. But look at this prophecy. That's how it will be with this generation. That's this people, this Israel. Jesus cast out multitudes of demons as he went across the country. Cast them out. Got rid of them. And then the whole country turned on him. Majority of it. And that multitude came back. Moved in. And then walked went and brought seven times more worse than itself and rather than just be addicted to the few rules of the sabbath in jesus day you got a taste of what they're under now that's from those seven multiplied thousands of demons that came back to israel and started giving them ideas about how they could clean their house and be in order If there's ever been a bruised reed on earth, it's Israel. Impossible to fix. But God. God has promised. He's going to send His Son again to Israel. And offer Him life one more time. Mm. And when He sends His Son, He's also going to send a spirit of conviction. And they're going to fall down at his feet and worship him. Zechariah 12 told about it. I will pour out the spirit of grace and of supplication. And they will look to me whom they have pierced. And they will mourn, they will mourn as one mourns for an only son, bitterly crying out for him as one would bitterly cry out for a firstborn. And then, because they repent, they respond to his call. 
the feeling he gave them to, to mourn for the maltreatment of his son the first time, he's going to pour out the Holy Ghost and wash their sins away. Zechariah, the next chapter says, In that day there will be a fountain opened for the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and uncleanness. And watch this. And I will drive the prophets and the spirit of uncleanness out of the land. And if those unclean spirits ever come back, they're going to find an occupied house. Because Jesus is going to be on the throne in Israel. Woo! Mm. Now recently, I don't know if it was last time or the time before, I told you something about our, our most difficult trial in this life is being steadfast in the face of opposition from those who are closest to us, the people we love, family, friends. Well, in the last section we're going to go over, Jesus shows his disciple how to do that, his disciples how to do that. Verse 6, 46, while he was saying all these things, all the while that he was speaking to the multitudes, behold, his mother and brothers had been standing outside wanting to speak to him. Now they were actually come to take Jesus away and put him away somewhere because they thought he'd lost his mind. As Mark says right, right here in Mark three twenty one, And when his kinsmen heard of it, they came out to take him for they were saying he's lost his mind. Well, someone got through the crowd. They couldn't get in. But someone got through to him and said, Behold, your mother and brothers have been standing outside wanting to speak to you. And he answered and said to the one who had spoken to him, Who is my mother? Who are my brothers? And extending his hand toward his disciples, he said, Behold, my mother and my brothers. Yes. For whoever does the will of my Father who is in heaven... The same as my brother and sister and mother. In other words, if those folks outside were really my mother and brother and sisters, they'd be in here where you are. Yeah. Yeah. This was a new definition of family. It wasn't figurative. It was real. If you can catch up to it. This is your life if you can catch up to it. If God's children would follow Jesus just in this one thing, who their family is, they'd be despised by all men. Yeah. Yeah. But the closer we come to thinking the way Jesus thinks about family, the more peace we'll have yeah. and the more fellowship we'll have yeah. with one another. Amen. Be thankful. Yes. Be thankful for and commit it to your real family. Yeah. There's an old saying that blood is thicker than water, and I believe that. I think the blood of Christ is thicker than the water you were born with. Amen. Blood is thicker than water. This blood is. Don't neglect your family. Don't let the bonds of fellowship grow weak and thin. I've seen that happen, and when it happens... You know what happens to people? They begin to hear thoughts. Actually, they, they think they're starting to have thoughts. But they're just hearing thoughts such as, I don't belong here. I'm not wanted here. But that's those demons whining about their condition. That's not you. They don't belong here. And they're not wanted here. Amen. And if we have enough power, they won't be had here. But that's what people who start losing a grip on their fellowship begin to hear. They drift it over where they pick up their radio signal. It's not you. It's not you. Those unclean spirits have been cast out of heaven and they're not wanted. They don't belong. They're vagabonds looking for a home. Looking for somebody to let their thoughts be their thoughts. And they all start, they start feeling, they start feeling the 
the miserable feelings that those spirits live under all the time. You know, they seek it, see waterless places and they can't find a home. That's misery. People who drift over and start hearing those thoughts from those other beings start feeling the feelings of those other beings of being mistreated, misunderstood, not wanted, not fitting in. What's wrong? What's wrong? You are the apple of God's eye. You belong. You are wanted. You've been wanted since before the world began. You have not been mistreated or misunderstood by anybody who counts. You believe that? And you will never feel like you don't fit in with the family God created you to be a part of. Stay away from those spirits. Stay away from spiritual weakness. Stay away from the things that tune in to other channels and keep your eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And I was, I was really blessed to walk in here and see that Brother Gary had a song ready to sing titled... Get, drive those voices out of your head. So I asked him if he, did, if he didn't know anything about what I was going to say. Ask him if he would wait to the end to sing it. I want to hear it. <laughs> You're going to hear an odd song. <laughs> I was When I was working on this a few days ago, I was started to work on it. I said, God, this is just too odd. And he said, that's because it's far-reaching. Yes. And I said, far-reaching? I didn't even know what that meant. Far-reaching? What do you mean far-reaching? So I just kept kept working to come to make it work on it. But we were sitting here the other day in the morning. We were talking about the, the spirit of Christianity, how it's just everywhere. And it's so embedded in our in our being that it's become part of us. Yes. And then the Spirit said to me, it's far-reaching. It's reached everywhere. It's yes. far-reaching. Yes. And uh, I'll tell you what, John, Pastor John, your message today reached far in me. Amen. And I said, right. now I get it. Now. Yeah. I didn't get the song. I just got the song right here, right now. I just got it. So I hope. Amen. <laughs> No, it's coming on the first one. Okay. Do your best. Okay. <clears throat> one, two, three. Drive those voices out of your head, out of your head, out of your head. Drive those voices out of your head, drive the voices out of your head. Voices bring superstition and doubt. Feel your joy so you can shout. Give them the time to move the spirit out. Drive those voices out of your head. Amen. Drive the voices out of your head. Shout, drive the top and move it out. 